It's the one you've all been waiting for if you go to my university. The longest book I probably will ever read. Clarissa by Samuel Richardson. Clarissa, written by the printer Samuel Richardson after his first novel, Pamela, which is only about 500 pages, somehow, was a success. This novel is about a young girl whose family try and make her marry someone she doesn't like because they don't want her to inherit th their uncle's fortune. And so she doesn't want to marry him, so she runs off with a creepy old bastard called Lovelace, actually not particularly old and very good looking. Despite the length of the book, it's very easily broken down into three acts. Act one is when Clarissa is with her family, about four or five hundred-ish pages, making numerous attempts to try and make her marry Mr. Solms who she detests. We never really find out why, other than his reasons for wanting to marry her to do with finance and quite vague, but she doesn't need a reason. He's not someone she wants to marry, and her family will not let her not marry him. So this section is probably the most depressing of the novel, I would say, even though it's not supposed to be. The last section is supposed to be the most depressing, but the whole feeling that she does not have any power and no one's on her side is just so utterly bleak. Nothing in modern society really compares to your entire family turning against you off this one thing. The second section, the middle one, which the blurb would have you believe is the majority of the novel, but it's only like a third of it is when Clarissa is with Lovelace, as with he tries to make numerous attempts to take her virtue, which end up failing, so he just rapes her because he's an awful human being. Um, he intercepts her letters, he makes shit up about her family wanting a reconciliation, even hires one of his friends to pretend to be a family friend of theirs in order to egg her on to marry him, uh, which doesn't turn out well for either of them, and I think because nothing really gets explored in this section, it's just Lovelace is a horrible person and Clarissa is a victim, it does, it's probably the weakest of the three, I would say. The last section is Clarissa's slow decline after her rape, and I actually enjoyed this section possibly the most. Maybe part, part of that was to do with the end of the novel being in sight, and because it's such a big book, I mean, even if it was amazing, I would still look forward to finishing it because it's so fucking long. And it was fairly good, but it's still exciting being that near the end of it. I've, I've finished it now, so I'm very pleased about that. But um, that was not the only reason. This section was really interesting because of uh, Clarissa's dying thoughts, or spoiler again, but... I do tend to spoil things in these reviews, warning. Um, and how she treats her family as she's dying. But I think possibly more so than any of these things, the most important part of this section is an introduction of Belford. I mean, Belford as a character is sort of littered throughout Lovelace's sections. He pops up here and again, but he's more of a spectator until until after the rape, he really comes into his own. And I think he's maybe not the most interesting character in the novel, but he's certainly the most comfortable to read. Clarissa herself is a little bit sort of overly pious, as my English teacher would point out. She's too good. I find she's actually quite selfish, petulant, and a little bit... Um, emotion manipulative as well as being incredibly pious so she's not the most likable person in the world Belford is the most honest and good character but that raises problems in itself as to his own characterization which I will return to later on in this review but for those reasons and for Clarissa's attitude to death and Belford's introduction it's probably the section I enjoy the most. But this sort of plot summary is basically obsolete because the book is about its characters. As Samuel Johnson would have said, 
let me find the quote. The first book of the world of the knowledge, it displays the human heart. Wisdom from a very long dead literary critic there. But he does have a point. Um, he also said, I think, which isn't quoted here, that if you read Richard Zimmer's a plot, you would hang yourself. Clarissa herself, I will start with. Because my English teacher often says she doesn't like Clarissa at all, and that she's a very bad character, I felt often the need to defend her. Because she's not that bad. She's fairly enjoyable to read. She's not particularly preachy, she's just a little bit dumb. But she's still the least interesting character in the novel. She there, she's there to serve a purpose, a purpose of instruction, because somehow all literature these days needed to be instructive. If it didn't tell you something, it wasn't literature. Whereas, obviously, nowadays, it would be almost the complete opposite, which, thank God for that, honestly. Um, but Clarissa's basically there to warn people that if you act like her, you will fall and be raped. But also, if you don't act like that, her, you'll be raped. She's a strange dual narrative um, message. Because, yeah, I feel like Simon Richardson saying, be like her, but don't act like her. On the one hand, she's incredibly pious to the point where she couldn't really get any more, per more so on her dying deathbed. That doesn't make any sense, ignore that. On her deathbed, she forgives all her family for all the bad things they've done to her, whereas a normal person would probably say, fuck you, you caused my death. Although her letters to her family are quite passive-aggressive, and I would say she arguably did that, basically, without saying it. But that's besides the point. She doesn't actively do anything at all. She gets other people to do things for her. But she's very pious about it, so I suppose she's a warning not to do any of the things she actually does, I suppose. Which is the only thing she does is run away with Lovelace. But act like her when she's not doing anything? I don't know. It's a very confusing device. Then there's Lovelace himself, who is the, one of the best villains I've ever read, I think. As literary villains go, I can only think of a few off the top of my head who are better. Yago, for instance, is obviously the go-to for a villain. He's not quite as good as Yago, but he is very, very well written. He's just such a terrible person. I don't know how any of the people of those days could have fallen in love with him, but then, on the other hand, there's a certain part of me that does know, because other than, I'd say, the second main villain of the book is Clarissa's brother, we don't really, apart from a few angry letters to Clarissa early on, we don't really hear his voice much. Um, and I mean, I hated him possibly more than I hated Lovelace, but with sort of a less of a passion. Because, for example, at the time I'm doing this review, Kevin Spacey's sex allegations have just been released a couple of weeks ago. And he's gone on the stage and he's tried to apologise for it. He said he's gay. In to, to distract people. Lovelace's letters, which are probably about a third of the book, maybe not quite as much as that, but at least a quarter, are just an endless rape apology speech or a preparation for rape apology speech. He spouts so much bullshit of why it was okay, could he done this, why is finally done this to Clarissa, makes, his, makes it okay because her family were horrible to him, and he he's very the snake in the garden, he completely manages to justify himself. After Lovelace, Anna Howe is probably the most well characterised character in the novel. She is much like a modern woman, but in some ways fundamentally different. She obviously conforms to the society's um, preconceptions of virtue, being friends with Clarissa, but some of the things that she tells Chris to do are quite sort of, I don't want to say proto-feminist, because obviously Sam Richardson's as far from proto-feminist as you can possibly get. Um, but she's very, she's the sort of character you'd find in a late 19th, early 20th century novel, rather than this kind of novel.
maybe not quite 21st century standards of self-sufficient, but she's a lot more willful and strong, strong-minded than Clarissa. Uh, which is it's easy to think of her as the cool character in the book, but then Manga Shik she did point out that she does sort of live a bit vicariously through Clarissa. Is obsessed with her, and she described her as the fat woman on the train who watches people. Sort of, but still, she's much more likable than that. And I'd say, unlike Clarissa, she's got some clear flaws, which are obviously meant to be there. Whereas with Clarissa, I feel like all her flaws are sort of passive aggressiveness, which isn't really what Richardson wanted her to be like. But yeah, Anna Hammond's probably my second favourite character, after Belford, who I will get to soon. Belford, I think. John Belford, who is Lovelace's confidant, who doesn't really become a prominent character until the last quarter, is probably my favourite character to read from his perspective. But also, possibly, out of the main four, the worst characterised, because he's just such a warm-hearted, nice guy. Um, everything he does is in the interests of other people. I mean, he doesn't warn Clarissa about Lovelace's intentions, but he didn't really know her then. And he tried to stop Lovelace from doing it. That's his only slight mistake. But from that point onwards, he doesn't do anything wrong. And he's, unlike Clarissa, he doesn't sort of, isn't overly pious. He's not dull. He's just so nice, warm-hearted. But throughout the book, we get told that he's basically used to be just like Lovelace, possibly, well, Lovelace claims even worse, and, I mean, obviously Lovelace would exaggerate it, but I don't believe he could ever be anything like that. He's, he, there's no hints that he is tempted to go back to his old ways, or anything. It's quite poorly done. He doesn't seem like a particularly torn character, whereas that's clearly once what Sammy Richardson wants us to think he is. So, that's simultaneously the best and worst character in the book. You don't really get many letters from them, but Clarissa's family are the most vile and horrible people ever, and I think they're very well done of how much you hate them. Specifically, I think, at the most out of any of them, Clarissa's mother. Clarissa's obsessed with how lovely and wonderful her mother is, and it's like, oh, you're the perfect mother. I wish I could kiss the bottom of your dress or that, that kind of thing but she's a horrible person really she emotionally manipulates Clarissa to try and make her marry Mr Solms uh, oh I'm, I'm ill now because you won't marry Mr Solms do it for your mother so she won't die and it's obviously a very low ploy she's betrayed her daughter but she won't even admit it unlike the more imperious but very honest male characters I mean, I suppose John Harlow is sort of the same, but those two, they just use some very low emotional blackmail for Clarissa, and it's very well done. Although I'm not sure if Samuel Richardson wanted the mother to be so detestable, or whether it was another one of his bad choices of characterization, telling you one thing about a character and showing another which is something that happens a lot in this novel, which is why I think that it's maybe a bit overrated. Although, on the other hand, everyone on my course hates it, including the lecturer, and I feel like it's not that bad. Finally, the length. Is it necessary? I would say no, because it's about almost double the size of War and Peace, a novel famous for its scope, and it's only really got about five or six major characters and they say a lot of the same things over and over again. Like, oh, Clarissa is a most virtuous, wonderful lady. Clarissa must marry Mr. Soms, or Clarissa's going to be dead soon, that kind of thing. There's only, only really changes what's actually happening about four times. I really would hang myself for just read it for the plot. That being said, there was very few points in the novel where I really hated it. So I'm going to give it a B, maybe a C, sort of. If I was Anthony Fontana from the internet's busiest music nerd, I would say, I'll like B to a strong C. So I'm going to speak in an American accent for the rest of this video. No, I'm not.